and our founders very much believe that students deserve a place in the political system that allowed them to voice their ideas and actually put them forward and make some change with them. So we've been sort of working on, on that goal for the last 12 years. We've had obviously an interesting moment over the last uh, six months, as I'm sure many of you have. Um, but we're, we're really excited to bring all of you together to talk a little bit about the issue of the privatization of education. Um, so our sort of interest into this topic began um, sort of a few months ago as we were thinking about ways to bring together the intersectional work that our students do in many ways. One of the key avenues that showed up to us was the importance of finding ways um, to, to sort of talk cross-sectorally across education, across the economy, across human rights issues, find ways to talk about sort of a, a national narrative that applies to all of those things. And one of the big things that we see coming from this administration is a, a real change in terms of how we're going to be providing for the public good in a host of areas, or in many ways, I should say, an acceleration of a trend that we've seen for a very, very long time. So we wanted to build a project that would take these questions of how do we provide for the public good very, very seriously and examine this threat or what we believe is a threat of privatization to the public good. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about what we've been doing so far. On the call, we have some, some of our students are sort of joining us from various places. We have about sort of a, a host of different student projects from across the country who've already very much started in their in this initiative. They are finding ways to work for the public good in their communities across the country. Um, and they're already doing a fantastic job with that. So all of the folks joining us from the Republic Incubator, thank you all for being here. Um, one of those folks, uh, Nikki, is actually on the panel and we're very excited to have her sort of talk about some of the work she's been doing. Um, so this is the first of our, of our webinars this summer. We're going to be putting three together. I mentioned at the start that what we're looking to do is talk about sort of the, the privatization. We believe very strongly that these issues are intersectional, but we're going to try and break up this into three conversations, one on the issue of education privatization, one on the issue of the privatization of the economy, and a third on the ways in which our human rights and justice systems are also being privatized. So. Let's get started with today's conversation, having given you that little bit of background. I'm really excited because the, the four panelists that we've been able to bring together today all represent a really wide array of sort of diverse viewpoints, but also very, very diverse experiences and can talk to you about many different elements of this. Um, so let's actually run through who they are. Um, our first panelist um, is Frank Adamson. He's at the Sanford Center for Opportunity Policy and Education. And to just give you a quick sense of Frank's work, Frank currently studies the effects of different political and economic approaches to education on student experiences and their performances in school. In the US, he, reaches, he researches the impacts of charter schools and portfolio districts on students, teachers, and communities. Internationally, he compares strategies of privatization and public investment in national education systems. Previously, he has published on the adoption of assessments of deeper learning and 21st century skills at the state, national, and international levels, as well as on teacher salary differences. Frank, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to have you. Thank Our you. second panelist today is Sarah Mondale. Sarah is the director of Backpacks Full of Cash. Sarah co-founded Stone Lantern Films in 1986 with producer Sarah Patton. Their nonprofit company has a long record of award-winning documentary films, many of which explore the essential role of public institutions in a democracy. She directed and co-produced the landmark PBS series School, the Story of American Public Education that was narrated by Meryl Streep and seen by an estimated six million viewers. In addition, she's also um, sort of directed a few one-hour PBS documentaries that some of you may be familiar with. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for being willing to talk about and sort of show us a short clip from Backpacks Full of Cash today. Oh, Backpacks Full of Cash, sorry. Fantastic. Our third panelist today um, is Jocelyn Garcia. Jocelyn is uh, Vice President at the United States Student Association. She's a first-generation student and alumni of the University of California, Santa Barbara. She's the daughter of Mexican Guatemalan immigrants and a sister of two younger brothers. Her organizing career actually began at UCSB when she attended a student of color conference hosted by a statewide student association. And since then, she's led multiple campaigns during her two years as a board member of USSA, including State of Emergency, Free Higher Ed, something we're, we're going to hear a lot about today, and organized the largest million student march in the country in which over 1,500 individuals participated. Justin, we're very excited for you to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. 
And finally, our fourth panelist um, is someone who I've had the pleasure of working with very closely over the last year as the Education Policy Coordinator for the Roosevelt Network. Um, Nikki Felmus is currently a senior at Columbia University. She's majoring in American Studies and Education. Um, in her role as Education Policy Coordinator, she's helped students in the Roosevelt Network write and advocate educational policies across the country. Her own policy, Integrating New York City Schools, Equalizing Educational Opportunities, was published in Roosevelt's 2016 10 Ideas for Education. I would love to tell you about that, but who better to talk about that than Nikki herself a little bit later in this webinar. Nikki, thank you so much for being here. All right, so let's actually um, bring, in, bring in some other voices. I'm sure all of the attendees are, are pretty tired at this point of hearing my voice, so we, you have the privilege of, of hearing from some of these actual panelists. So why don't we start on um, sort of, Frank, why don't we start with you where we would love to get a little bit of background of what do we mean by the privatization of education? Absolutely, so go ahead, start, start the slideshow. <laughs> So um, I want to reference uh, this book that we just came out with. It's a shameless plug, but actually it does have good information in it um, where we compared six different countries, three that have done privatization of education and three that have done public education. So a lot of the findings of in my analysis, I had to go back and figure out what we did mean by privatization in order to write the book. So uh, next slide. So uh, what we looked at um, in the – that's uh, – not the net keep going there I guess there's a there there are some there we go it's sorry it was off a little bit so just make the whole slide appear um, so privatization occurs along three different dimensions at least three one would be the management where um, you know a, a private company or organization would come in and uh, take over management or start management in place of a government um, and when we say privatization, and when I think about it, most often I think about uh, the management side of things. Uh, privatization can also be on the, on the funding side. There can be public funding for private management, which I would refer to as privatization of a, of a service, right, such as education or health care. But that could also be privately funded, so you could have private schools, and that's privatization. That actually happens uh, a lot in uh, you know the United States and, and other countries around the world as a replacement for public education, or there could be a combination. Public-private partnerships are happen all over the world, and then there's the ownership side, which could also be um, say like a charter school, which is privately managed, receives publicly funded, and operates in a public building, but it's still privately managed. Or the, the say the school system could sell the building to the charter school. And then you'd have a privately uh, managed, publicly funded, privately owned school building. So as you can see, it's a little bit complex to think about it. But, you know, if you were to put it on like the tic-tac-toe grid on the upper left-hand corner, you'd have public, public, public. And then everything else is sort of this cascade of levels of influence of private actors. And we care about this because at each point of management funding and ownership, it's possible that the public would be excluded from the conversation. And that's what we, we learn when we look at different privatized actors and outcomes, that when the public does get excluded, decisions often end up uh, creating or exacerbating inequalities rather than investing in the public good. Where does this come from? So we look at this long-standing political and economic debate. I just found this uh, Keynes versus Hayek. Uh, I, Webs, uh, it's basically a blog on the Roosevelt Institute's website, so I recommend people check that out. But basically, we look at this subsidiary state model in which um, von Hayek was a proponent of the free market. The idea is that competition and choice drive innovation and quality. And then um, von Hayek, and it really interestingly, you know, he was resuscitating Adam Smith's ideas, but he felt like he... Um, was very against uh, uh, the power of the state because of World War I in Europe. So you can see this oscillation of state power and economic free market power at play. Keynes came in and said, you know what, um, we had the famous Keynesian economic model where it was that the government would, could go into debt and publicly invest and then it would actually be good for the more people. 
and the New Deal in Roosevelt has some echoes of that. Uh, and then now in the modern era, we have Milton Friedman and Reagan on the subsidiary state free market side. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then Bernie Sanders, I would say, is an interesting sort of modern day uh, welfare state uh, proponent. In education, you have the examples of vouchers, charter schools in the United States and other countries, and low-fee private schools. So uh, how am I doing? That, I'll, I'll leave that as my three minutes. <laughs> I think uh, I, about one more minute. Is that what? Sure, one more minute. OK, <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit more about education. So go to the next slide. So in, in education, we had two very different, and click it once more. We had two very different pathways emerge in the in the 70s. So as I said before, Milton Friedman was a free market uh, proponent, and they kind of went underground for years, for decades really, because Keynes was the Keynesian economic model was working, uh, and so they kind of came back in the 70s when stagflation occurred in the states. Meanwhile, in Chile, Pinochet came in in a dictatorship. And he decided to enact Milton Friedman's privatization policies writ large in education in 1980 through a voucher system. And basically a voucher system means that the family gets the money for the school or for education and chooses where to send their students. And if you're a slightly wealthier family, you can pay a little bit more money and get a little bit better education. And in that way, over a 35 year period, we've seen of total reproduction of social inequality in that situation. And on the other hand, Finland has adopted an equity focus in the 70s, and they had a very different outcome. So you can, the last slide on this section. In 2011, after 35, 36 years of voucher systems, we had hundreds of thousands of people in the street in Chile protesting in a social movement around education which most people just want education to function. So when you go to the streets like that on mass, something is really not working. Whereas Finland in the 2000s had one of the highest test scores uh, across the board by subject and by year, um, starting in 2000 and throughout the, the international test scores for the last 15 years. So their focus on equity as opposed to privatization has really produced an entirely different education system. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Fantastic. Thank you, Frank. I, I think that that gives us sort of some, some fantastic background coming into this question of privatization. I want to drill down a little bit um, and talk a little bit about how this play, has played out specifically to start with um, in the sort of K-12 through field. Um, and sort of there's, there's no one better to talk about that than Sarah Mondale. Um, Sarah, would you mind talking, talking to us a little bit about how has education played out in the field of K through 12 education, and what led you to make this film, Backpack Full of Cash? Well, I um, come from a family of teachers. Um, my mother taught English to adult immigrants in the DC public schools, and my grandmother taught in a rural one room schoolhouse. Um, my father was a professor of American studies, and he always told us when we were growing up, uh, we were a big family you know, that public education was the bedrock of the democracy, and uh, we were taught to respect it. And um, so when I started hearing the constant repetition of the public schools are failing, public schools are broken uh, narrative, public schools need to be replaced by a free market system, I didn't believe it. And I uh, was upset by that. I was teaching at the time and thought, we've got to do something here. Um, I had made a series for PBS called School that looked at the history of the um, promise of public education from the one-room schoolhouse all the way up to Charters and Choice. And people suggested to me, my father actually, that uh, we do a kind of follow-up to that series. Uh, and the more I looked at it, the more I felt that privatization was actually undermining public education. Uh, we heard claims from people like Diane Ravitch and others uh, who critics who were saying that um, public education was actually being destroyed, and we said, no, that can't be true. Uh, that sounds a little extreme. Uh, you know, my kids went to public schools. I'm on the PTA. I went to public schools. Uh, how can that be? And they said, well, if you go to certain cities in the United States, you'll see, uh, you will see what's happening. Go to Philadelphia, for example. Go to New Orleans. 
And so that's what we did. Uh, we live in the New York area and ended up, you know, Philadelphia was more, was uh, closer and easier for us to get to. And um, so we started to look at what was going on in Philadelphia. We got some development funding and it ended up following the 2013-14 school year in Philadelphia just to see how these privatization issues were playing out and particularly what the impact of charters, choice, and uh, they don't have vouchers, but they have uh, what are called backdoor vouchers, these tax credit scholarships in, um, in, uh, in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia, as in, they do in many states. Um, and so we just wanted to see what the impact was on the public schools. That was our focus. There, there was another film that some of your um, fellows may have seen, or some of you may have seen, called Waiting for Superman, that was uh, a kind of a bit of a propaganda film for charters and school choice. And um, we wanted to answer that, to, to do a response to that film, really. Um, and so we ended up making what we decided to call Backpack Full of Cash. And that title came from an interview that we did of a um, proponent of school choices in the film, a woman named Jeannie Allen. Um, and she was saying that every child in America should have a backpack full of cash, that that's how we should run the education system. And uh, schools should compete for the business of every parent, every student, and the best one will win, and the bad schools will lose out. And um, charters, you know, privately run schools should compete with public schools and uh, religious schools, homeschooling, on down the line. So that idea of the backpack full of cash—I mean, we use that image in the film a lot—is the idea that we examine in the film. You know, how is this playing out, and what is the impact of that? ideology, uh, that philosophy, that approach uh, to policy on the most vulnerable children who uh, rely on public schools. And so that, that's why we spend a lot of time um, filming, for example, in South Philadelphia High School, which is a large urban high school where there's no music. There was no music at all the year that we filmed there. There was no music teacher, so there was no music. And, and that high school had had a proud tradition of musicians and famous composers who've gone through there. Uh, Marian Anderson went there, Chubby Checker. Uh, some of you might be uh, uh, too young to remember him, but there were various, you know, they had a proud tradition and basically they were there with no music, no art, one counselor for, um, you know, f 500 students. It, it, their funding had been cut to a point where it was an absolute desperate situation. And meanwhile, we look in the film at some of the privately run charter schools. This isn't the case for all of them, but some of them, including the one where we filmed, had, you know, laptops for every child. Um, they had all kinds of um, high-tech facilities, a motion capture studio. Due to grants and other funding that they had received, um, in addition to their, you know, backpack of cash or their, their per pupil funding. So we look at it as a, uh, the way we saw it, it was kind of turned out to be, you have these islands of privilege, which are some of these elite charter and private schools, but amidst an ocean of inequity. That's, that's what we kind of saw when we were there. And, and the growth of charter schools in Philadelphia, they had 86 charters, which is a lot. A third of the kids there went to, in, in the system, went to uh, charter schools, privately run charter schools. It se really did seem to be draining the public schools of cash and putting them in a desperate situation. They were already short of funds. Can't just blame privatization for that. But these two things seem to go hand in hand to us as filmmakers as we, you know, search to comprehend the story. Um, a lot of times reformers, quote unquote, will be pushing for private um, sector solutions that goes hand in hand with cutting funds. And that certainly was the case in Philadelphia and some other cities the year that we were filming. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sarah. I, I think um, sort of having having seen part of it, this, this film is sort of an absolutely fantastic piece of work. I would recommend it to anyone. And if, if you all are interested, I know Sarah and her team are still sort of working on some of the final pieces are going to be releasing it in the next few months. But if you are interested, of course, we sort of are, are happy to make some connections and would love to find any and all avenues we can to push this film out there and get it sort of uh, screened in, in places across the country. So, Sarah, thank you again for being here. Thank you again for letting us watch this film. Um, I want to transition a little bit into um, sort of 
So this film obviously highlights a sort of a, a, a host of issues within it. One of the things that it talks about is also the ways in which um, sort of public education is succeeding, but the ways in which we can continue to think about how to make public education sort of more racially equitable, more accessible. Um, Nikki, I, I want to turn to you because I know you have a project through the Republic Incubator that you're working on and with a sort of group of students at Columbia that I'm very, very excited um, to be, to, to sort of hear about. So could you talk to the group a little bit about the work that you all have been doing in New York? Yeah, so it started out um, fall of my sophomore year. I was talking to a friend who went to um, a high school in New York and who was talking about how the city's schools were segregated which was something I had never heard of. I'm from Virginia, so the South, so I knew segregation in the South. I knew that Brown versus Board of Education ended segregation, but this idea that schools are still segregated. Um, so after talking to him, I researched specialized high schools in New York. I researched segregation within schools in New York and found that if you look at the specialized high schools, which are nine high schools in all five boroughs of the city, um, they pull a audience that is not as diverse as the city itself. So Stuyvesant High School on average has about 72% Asian students per class um, and their makeup in the city is a lot smaller. Um, there were nine freshmen in Stuy nine black freshmen in Stuyvesant's class this past year and um, African American students make up a larger majority of the city. So I wrote a policy for Roosevelt about making magnet programs within neighborhood high schools to try and increase the amount of uh, options for students, but also to spread out the academically prestigious schools and to increase diversity within schools. Um, now, that's something that's hard to get people on board with, right? Because that's taking away a system that's been in place since around the 1950s. Um, so we've been looking at the specialized high school admissions test specifically, which is the only requirement to get into eight of the city's nine specialized high schools, um, including Stuyvesant High School, Bronx Science, and uh, Brooklyn Tech. Um, so looking at that test, it's never been tested for its predictive validity. This was also the case with a test to become a member of the fire department in New York. Um, what predictive validity means is that whatever you get on the test predicts how well you'll do in that school. So the SHSAT, it's how it's shortened, has never been tested for this. Now, this is a bit of a problem if you look at students and how well they do on the specialized high school test versus how well they do on their end of year exams in school. So there's a discrepancy in that with um, racial data and also in relating to income. So we're looking at that difference and trying to work towards advocating um, New York to invest money in testing the specialized high school admissions test for its predictive validity as the first step in trying to integrate New York City's um, academically prestigious schools. Absolutely. Thank you, Nikki. And I, I think one of the one of the things that sort of I really appreciate about the, the work that Nikki and, and sort of the team at Columbia are doing is it's thinking very seriously about ways in which we can sort of improve the public educational system or continue to improve the public education and strive for more sort of racially diverse outcomes in ways that we hope will serve as a bulwark against privatization in the future. Um, I want to transition the conversation a little bit. We've talked sort of a fair bit about K through 12 education and I want to move a little bit into the sort of higher educational field. Um, Jocelyn, I, I would love to hear from you at this point and I, I want to hear about sort of how have we seen this issue of privatization and public disinvestment play out in higher education? And how is this or why has this trend been especially dangerous for low income students, first generation students, and students with sort of minority backgrounds, non traditional students in general? Yes. Um, can, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Um, so thank you, Aman, um, for those questions. And, you know, shout out to the rest of you all for doing the amazing work that you have. Um, so, Thinking about this question, I think of several things that come into my head. You know, the first thing, just to you know, provide context, is that when education was first coming about in this country, it was not seen as a public good, and it was something that only the elite had access to. However, with you know, with time and a ton of organizing behind it, it became to be recognized as a public good within our society. And you know, today it is recognized as a public good. However, you know, something to highlight, especially as uh, within higher education, and we kind of noted how it is in K-12, is that it resembles more of a private good 
instead of a public good, which is what it should be. And the U.S. Student Association has always believed that education is every individual's right and it shouldn't be a privilege or a commodity. However, due to that public disinvestment and the privatization of higher education, it's becoming um, the, the private good that I was just talking about, um, giving less accessibility to so many folks. So um, to get into specifics as to how exactly that's impacting higher education, um, because of that disinvestment and the privatization, universities are placed in a situation where they must seek out different sources of revenue um, for funding and being able to balance out, again, that disinvestment from representatives um, and the expenditures to maintain the institution. So many public universities in particular have began to mirror a lot of the efforts that private universities are doing. Um, so looking at donors and foundations as the sources of revenue. Um, and, you know, I know that uh, I believe Frank got into this a little earlier in terms of decision making. Um, when you start relying more on donors and foundations, your agenda changes and it becomes their agenda. And the public, and more in particular the students, start losing control as to how much access they have to the decision making. And the decision making becomes more centralized, and again it becomes the agenda of those folks who are giving them the money that also creates um, the autonomy of the faculty is put at risk and um, the interests and the focus of the university again becomes to fundraise for the institution instead of really investing in their faculty, um, the curriculum that the students um, are being taught and more so like what the campus climate is of those students. So that is one way that universities begin to seek um, means as to how to balance out their budgets. But another way which we have particularly seen um, within more recent years and this year many of our students and even students outside of USSA uh, went through tuition hikes in which the tuition was raised in many of the campuses. And just to provide some context, within the past 20 years tuition at private universities has gone up 179% and a staggering 296% has raised within public institutions. So those are massive numbers, um, which honestly like goes into how the burden has been laid out on students. And with the rise in tuition, again, that disinvestment, students are then placed in a really bad situation um, because then they have to figure out how they're going to pay for their education. And what we have seen from many of our students, some of them very close peers, and myself, you know, we have had to take on two to three jobs to afford the costs. And then you have to pose a question as to how is this impacting the student studies? You know, how much time are they actually spending on the classroom and um, engaging within the research that they're doing and the education that they're being taught? But also, most importantly, is how is this impacting their physical and mental health if they have to take on all these occupations to be able to meet the costs. Um, so again, like just to reiterate, a lot of the decision making becomes centralized. There's there is a tuition hikes within many of our campuses, and tuition has gone up in incremental ways. Um, and because of that, you know the student debt has gone up, um, and many students have to rely on student loans. Um, just to also give some context as to how ridiculous those numbers are, Americans owe over $1.4 trillion in student loan debt. That is, that is spread amongst 44 million borrowers. Now, credit card debt is $620 billion, and student debt is $1.4 trillion, which is, you know, again, ridiculous because you see how the disinvestment in education is. And... When you have students um, graduating with debt, that has very severe impacts and on our economy. I know I'm kind of going onto a tangent, but I think this point is very important. So when you have a rise in student loan debt, you know that slows down consumer spending, the housing market, the creation of new businesses, and so many other things, which then slows down the financial growth in our consumer-driven economy. So all of these things. Um, basically impact the way higher education is being run. 
And I'm on to go into the second part of your question as to how this impacts um, non-traditional students, first generation, low income, and students of color in particular, is that these students, they don't have the safety nets that many of their white counterparts do. And students um, within these particular communities, they rely on university, state, and federal financial, financial assistance to attend college. And so when you start pulling that assistance from there um, and you get the rising cost in the tuition, um, students become much more vulnerable. And again, like it's these particular students who have to find themselves in that situation as to whether they are going to borrow student loans or they're going to graduate student debt. And students of color actually have higher rates of student debt, and in particular, African Americans. Um, and unfortunately, at times, these students, they don't have the means to be able to take out these loans, and you find, they find themselves in a position where they choose to drop out of their education. In a report released by the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, it shows that white students completed their programs at a rate of 63%, whereas Latino and black students graduated at a rate of 45.8% and 38%. Again, like there's a huge gap right there in terms of the completion of their programs. Um, and you have to say, we believe in this idea of education justice, which means that we believe in dismantling all the barriers that prevent a student of color, a first-generation student, a student from a low-income background to have access and flourish within their education. Um, however, students of color and first-generation low-income students, they face multiple barriers, as many of the colleagues have been mentioning throughout this presentation. And something that I would like to note is that the institution of higher education as to how it was created and how it currently exists, it was not built by or for people of color and women. However, education has become this great equalizer in society. Um, it's become this tool to level the playing field for many of these communities who have been marginalized, discriminated against, and oppressed for decades um, in order for them to be able to compete in society. But when that tool has, is becoming less and less accessible, you know, they're getting stuck in their current situation. They're getting stuck in that poverty cycle, and the opportunity of them actually being able to achieve their American dream is becoming less and less accessible. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but I hope that answers the question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Aslan. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, a couple of the things you laid out in terms of the ways in which these donations and the, the shift in the higher educational structure has real questions about the ways in which power is working on campuses and who does and doesn't will power on those campuses is really important along with the issue of when we talk about public education cuts, who is the public education really being cut from? It's really important to talk about this through a sort of race-based, uh, a class-based and gender-based lens because a lot of these cuts and a lot of these changes are very disproportionate. Um, I do I do want to say for folks, uh, for sort of our audience, if you have any questions at this time, please sort of, um, you'll see a question bar um, in, in on your sort of uh, webinar software on the right hand side. Please submit any questions you might have. Our panelists would love to um, sort of answer them. To go back to, to sort of um, the conversation we were having right now, I mean, so we've talked about the ways in which the privatization model has played out in higher education or sort of in charters and in higher education. I want to ask you, Frank, um, this, this sort of trend goes well beyond the US, doesn't it? So can you talk a little bit about how this model has been exported? What are some of its outcomes? I'm going to have to ask you to um, try and do that within about four minutes, if that's at all possible. I know just how much of a Herculean challenge that might be. Bring up the slides. <laughs> so uh, next, so basically, the, the export location, as I mentioned before, is Chile. Next slide. And in Chile, we saw, you can continue to roll through, uh, that there was basically an adoption of the neoliberal policies um, which are free market and privatization oriented and then they change from the welfare state to a subsidiary state through a military model. Uh, so that's an important case to note. It wasn't really willing by the country. Next slide. And then when we look at the changes that happen, um, we already have talked about funding. At the K-12 level, there were vouchers implemented. So students carried money to schools and the higher ed, they began charging tuition. Um, like Jocelyn just mentioned, 
There's more private schools. I'll get to that in a second. Standardized tests were then used to measure um, whether schools or students were doing well and then used punitively um, to close schools or however, you know, in a high stakes manner. And there was decentralization, which led to uh, basically different levels of service provision according to your, uh, who, whose student you were serving. Next slide. And so we see this expansion over time. If you look at the green line, those are the private voucher schools. And they are, they are now more private voucher schools than actual public schools in Chile uh, since 1980. So you can see that the prevalence has just been huge. And what does that mean for students? Next slide. What, what you essentially get is this um, radical stratification. So this is a very difficult uh, slide to kind of comprehend. But if you look at the, the left side is the public, and the red and the blue are the middle, low, and low income groups. So that's predominantly aggregated in the public. The private subsidized has the green and purple, which are the middle and the middle high groups. So they're kind of the ones that can afford a little bit better education. And then the highest socioeconomic elite goes to the fully private schools. So you, you have a situation where people are calling basically apartheid in education in Chile by the socioeconomic status, in the United States, socioeconomic and racial status. Keep, next slide. And so what happened were we had these waves of protest that culminated uh, in hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. And I mean, proper protests, tanks and water cannons and stuff you didn't see on the US news. Next slide. And there were political victories. So there were new uh, changes um, and new laws to prohibit profit from the uh, people uh, running the schools. There was an end of student selection. We talked, Nicole talked about the testing, right? Why do we have testing for a public school in, at all? Why aren't we everybody? Why doesn't everybody get to go to Stuyvesant? Uh, and then there was an abolishment of the copay, uh, which doesn't allow us parents to top up their funding for their voucher. Next slide. So, and, uh, and keep going through that. And we see actually that the impacts, uh, in the book we compare Chile with Cuba, and you can see right there that on the international test, Cuba is a public investment model that has massively better uh, testing. So uh, if we continue a little bit more, we look at in the United States, the same voucher system exported in, or really re-imported into the United States, right? Because we exported it through Milton Friedman. Um, and next slide. It started in 1990, and we see that voucher enrollment, and you notice how this, this chart is going, right? You know where this is going in the next 20 years. See, this is part of the point about looking at internet, international examples. We're gonna hit the crossover where you're going to have these huge voucher um, schools. So continue. And we see the results are that there's still the same, uh, there's no noticeable improvement achievement and that uh, the achievement gaps remain. Continue. Next slide. And basically we look at it as a business model uh, and that's the superintendent of Milwaukee saying that schools are a business. I can pause there or I, I can continue. There's the whole case in New Orleans is what, what's, what's left, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. I want to hear from other people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, that's fantastic. Let me, I think one of, one of the, the very interesting pieces you draw out is some of the ways in which um, sort of folks in other nations have helped to push against some of these trends and reclaim their education, reclaim their access to this very, very important public good. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to say that we have some folks on the line who are doing just that. So. Um, Justin, let me let me ask you. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the sort of free public higher education campaign that USSA has been working on? What have been some of the outcomes or successes from that work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the idea of free public higher education, it with especially within the USSA space, it started far before I got involved with the organization. Um, you know, student leaders and my predecessors were talking about that maybe about 50 years ago, where they actually took a stand saying that they were in favor and supported of free public education, um, higher education. 
that was funded by the local, state, and federal governments. And however, how we actually saw it into practice, especially within like the recent decade, is that USSA would lead campaigns that address the disinvestment within education, um, but the campaigns particularly particularly asked for accessible and affordable higher education and not necessarily free. However, in the year 2014-2015, the organization and our students did a pretty radical shift where instead of talking about accessible and affordable higher education, they went out and said, we want free public higher education. And that's where the campaign came about. Um, and the reason that you know, we made that shift and, you know, Frank goes into it a little bit when he talks about the resistance that was being seen in many of these other countries was that many of our students, we knew that we could attain free public higher education and we believed in it and we were also inspired by a lot of the movements that were taking place across other countries and, you know, we said that if this is possible elsewhere, you know, you, the U.S. definitely has the resources to make that a possibility here. It's just about reprioritizing um, the priorities within the current budget. And so in terms of how we actually went and tried to put that into practice and some of the outcomes that we've been able to, res uh, to achieve within the past couple years and the tactics is that we tried to have a balance between a lot of grassroots organizing but a lot of work within um, policy and within the legislative sector. So we try to balance between those. And in 2014 and 2015, um, when the campaign was first launched out, launched out and USSA was very vocal about um, free public higher education, um, we had a, an action in Washington, D.C. Um, in between the Supreme Court building and the Capitol Hill, where Senator Sanders actually came out to our rally and we had about 200 students there from across the country um, protesting and rallying and 10 students um, actually got arrested. Uh, at the time I was one of those 10 students, um, no longer a student, but at the time I was. And that was the big kickoff campaign um, or event for the free, free, free higher education campaign. And a few weeks later, you know, President, excuse me, President candidate Senator Sanders at the time claimed that he was going to be running for president. And so uh, to provide context as to what the strategy was, we really wanted to push these representatives and these potential presidential candidates to believe in free education, to make that one of their priorities. So when we went out there and said, you know, we believe in free higher education, we incorporated some of the champions of education and told them, you know what, this is a possibility, work with us. And, you know, that's when the first version of the College for All Act was introduced. And it kind of was like a light switch because before then, Hillary Clinton, she wasn't talking about higher education or education in general um, in comparison to what how she was talking about near the end of her campaign. And USSA... Um, with the actions that we were having not only in D.C. but across the country with our membership, it really spiked this pressure within the presidential, presidential candidates, particularly Senator Sanders and Hillary Clinton, to make higher education a priority in terms of it being affordable, but in a way, again, it becoming free. And so that was the first year. And then the following year, uh, we also launched national collective action throughout the country through these million student marches. And um, you did mention um, one of the marches that we had within the bio. So we had about over 100 campuses participating in that. And again, like the demands was tuition-free public college, the cancellation of student debt, amongst other things. But again, it was about mobilizing the bases and getting students and the public to believe in this narrative that we can attain free public higher education. And this year, you know, we do have a very difficult Congress, and we were able to launch the second version of the College for All Act with Senator Sanders and Congresswoman Jai Pala. And the fight federally to obtain this is very difficult. However, we still believe that we need to draw the line on the sand and not let go of the values and, you know, the rights that we 
um, should have. And so, although the fight federally is very difficult, you know, we're uplifting state measures um, such as in New York and Oregon and California where they do have the legislatures to make this possible as we continue building momentum to obtain this federally. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Nikki, let me let me turn to you very quickly. Um, I think we, we have time for one more question. So um, can you talk a little bit about the work that sort of members at Roosevelt have done or, or just in if in two minutes you could just sum up how can students get involved in the type of work Roosevelt is doing as well in this field? Yeah, so definitely Roosevelt students can get involved. Look at your community, see if there's something up. If you have a lot of charter schools, look into them, do your research. Um, some things that are happening in the Roosevelt Network currently, um, Wheaton College is, students at Wheaton College are looking at textbooks and how textbooks can be more affordable to students, which is a large burden on a lot of students. I know I pay a lot for textbooks. Um, a lot of my friends do too, and that's a crazy amount, and why? Um, especially if it's at a private college. Um, we have students at University of Michigan looking at charter schools and trying to create um, systems to hold them more accountable and have more oversight for charter schools. And I think that's really an area where we can grow and do local and state level policy that can actually make a difference in our communities. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, so just to just to close out, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of close this out, and then we'll take one question. I just want to make sure folks see some of the follow-up links because I know some folks might have to hop off immediately at nine, but we will take at least one question uh, from the audience. Just so just in terms of some final and important notes, um, if you have any questions or thoughts, I want to follow up with any of the webinars. Oh my! Uh, also, sort of, I, I really hope you might you might want to be a part of the Republic project. If you do, please email me. Uh, my email is on the screen. I'm happy to make connections with other panelists as well, so long as they're willing. Um, like I mentioned at the start of the webinar, this is the first of our three-part series. Our second part will be held on July 5th, where we'll be talking about the privatization of education. That link that you see up on your screen, bit.ly backslash Republic Summer Webinar, that's where you can find all three of our webinars, and you can find an opportunity to RSVP to the next two. Um, Third thing I should mention is the recording of the conversation that web, uh, that sort of participants have had today will be available in a follow-up email from this, and we're, we're happy to share that. Um, and finally, if this has inspired you to want to start um, some kind of project in your community where you're thinking about ways in which the public good of education is being distributed, like sort of Nikki had just talked about, we would sort of love to, with Roosevelt, help you find a way to do that. We have, um, through our Republic project, that's very much what we're hoping to do, is build and support local policy ideas and local policy campaigns. And we have a, a what we call a loft guide um, that has a series of steps about how you could start, where the problems lie, and a link to some of all the fantastic research that folks talked about today. Um, so I wanted to get through some of those big, big follow-up items um, I do want to take one question, um, and I, I think we have a really, really interesting question from um, Kevin. I'd, I'd love any of the panelists to, to weigh in um, if they felt like they were sort of interested in answering. Um, Kevin's asks, um, can reports commenting on education, similar to the historical a nation at risk and a nation prepared, still have weight today in influencing education policy? How can fake news or institutional mistrust factor into it? I'd love to hear if any of the panelists want um, sort of have answers to that question. I mean, I'll, I'll take a jump at that. <laughs> the, the, you know, I, I mean, the short answer is yes. I don't think that you um, win an argument by saying we don't want evidence or the evidence doesn't matter, right? I mean, that actually, I would argue exactly the opposite, that we need reports that show exactly what's going on and we need to keep calling it out uh, over time and this is not a short process um, the development of uh, kind of fake news and really the complex behind what produced that in terms of the PR uh, was started by ALEC uh, the American Legislative Exchange uh, Commission in the 80s right it, this has been a long long process of neoliberalism and privatizing education in other sectors and it the results are here and they're in different places at different times right so there's trajectories and so New Orleans and Detroit were privatized early in Milwaukee in the United States they're very different I interviewed a parent in New Orleans and she said 
New Orleans is already done, but tell other parents in other cities what's going to happen to their city. That's the message from Chile. Don't do this, right? And so, but how do we keep lifting up what is happening and situating it and helping to do the larger education project by depending on the evidence, you know? You can lose the PR right. war, and you might lose the PR war because they have a lot of money. There's a lot of money to be gained in this, but you, we can't lose the evidence war, actually, and we won't because it, the reality is it doesn't really work except for a small crew of people who it always works for, and this is just the latest manifestation of that. So if we're worried about equity and people. We need to focus on that. Right, and I would say that's the message of our film. This is Sarah here. Um, it's kind of a cautionary tale about what does happen when you um, when you open up the doors to uh, the free market approach and choice and the backpack full of cash. Let's take a look. You know, is this something that we want in our communities? Uh, it actually, you know, we see that it led to uh, greater segregation and greater inequity uh, and um, bad situations for the most vulnerable kids. So, uh, do I have time for one more? quick thing uh, thought about the fake news no, one of the sure. oh I just wanted to say one thing that people need to be aware of is the coded language that's used a lot in this debate about public education uh, beware of words watch the words carefully and try to understand mm -hmm. the language because there are words like choice there are words like failing schools that are thrown around there are words like reform uh, you need to really dig into these uh, this terminology understand what people mean and figure out if you're okay with it, and, and use your words carefully. Uh, I think that's very important to look at the language that's being used in this debate. Fantastic. I, I think that that might be all of the time we, we, we sort of have today. I know I personally could sort of stay on this webinar and continue to talk about it till, till late in the night, but unfortunately for me, our panelists did not sign up for that, so I'm I'm going to have to let you off the hook at a certain point, and this may be uh, sort of that exact point. Frank, I want to say thank you so much for all of the research that you've done, for sort of your, your, your pioneering of the ways in which you, you've highlighted I, um, sort of the, the, the exportation of this education privatization model and its effects in other countries. Um, Sarah, again, I want to say thank you so much for sharing this clip with us and parts of this film with us. Um, it, it, is a, it is a really fantastic piece of work to hear and see these stories told as stories rather than just as sort of structural ramifications of big picture changes in policy is a really heartening and I think moving thing and I, I hope your film and I do believe your film will, will sort of contribute a lot to this debate and to engagement around it. Nikki, um, thank you for all you've done for this network over the last year and your work on education policy at large. And finally, Jocelyn, I, USSA has always been a leader in some of this sort of public higher education work, and in particular, I think, in, in, in calling out other organizations and other places and thinking very strategically about why race and class and gender need to be given special consideration and the ways in which these changes have had disproportionate effects on certain people and certain communities. So to all four of you, thank you so much for being here. And finally, to our audience, I... Um, sort of, I, I, I know it's hard to listen on to my droning voice for such a long period, so I, you, you are all obviously clear examples of fantastic fortitude, so thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure having you, um, and like I mentioned, we'll, we'll be having another webinar in about two weeks on the privatization of our economic systems. We'd love to have you join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.